The offensive operation of the First World War that claimed the most casualties is also the only major one named after its mastermind. I'm talking about Russia's Brusilov Offensive and its creator, General Alexei Brusilov. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to our Great War bio series of specials, Who Did What in World War I, today featuring Alexei Brusilov. He was born in 1853 in what was then Tiflis in the Russian Empire, but is now Tbilisi, the capital of Georgia. His father, a lieutenant general, was a decorated veteran of the Napoleonic Wars and was much older than his mother, who was of Polish origin. When Alexei was still a young boy, his parents died within a few months of each other, both quite likely from tuberculosis. He and his two brothers were adopted by an aunt and uncle. The uncle was Russian-German, and Alexei became fluent in French and German and learned a bit of English. He began military school at the age of 14 and graduated in 1872 with outstanding marks. He then joined the 15th Tver Dragoons, with whom he would remain until 1881. He saw action in the Russo-Turkish War of 1877 and 78, where he distinguished himself in just the first few hours of the Caucasus campaign, forcing a Turkish garrison to surrender without firing a single shot. By 1883, he was at the Officer Cavalry School in St. Petersburg. He would remain there for 19 years, eventually becoming its director. Interestingly enough, Karl Mannerheim, who would defend Finland against Russia in the Winter War in 1939 and 40, was one of his students. Mannerheim said this about Brusilov. He was an attentive, strict, demanding leader who shared very good knowledge. His war games and field exercises were exemplary in their planning and execution and extremely interesting. As a distinguished instructor, he traveled widely in Europe. He also became an internationally known horseman. In 1900, he was promoted to Major General. Now, in his personal life, he married in 1884, but his wife was very unhealthy and the couple had several stillborn children before their only son, Alexei, was born in 1887. His wife Anna died in 1908. Shortly after that, Brusilov became commander of the 14th Army Corps. In 1910, he married his second wife, Nadezhda. Now, her sister lived in the United States and was married to Charles Johnson, the Irish writer and theosophist. He and his wife visited the Brusilovs and through them, Alexei became interested in theosophy and the occult. Cut to early summer, 1914. Alexei and Nadezhda were on vacation in Germany. Shortly after Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated, they left Germany and headed home. Just three days after they left, the mass arrests of Russian tourists in Germany began. When the war broke out, Brusilov commanded the 8th Army on the southwestern front. As a cavalry general, he emphasized movement and attack. And during the Battle of Galicia, he defeated the Austro-Hungarian army and took 15,000 prisoners. Side note here, during the battle, the Russian 48th Infantry was nearly surrounded. Brusilov ordered the 12th Cavalry to relieve them, saying this, the 12th Cavalry Division is to die. Do not die immediately, but towards the evening. The relief was successful. During the disastrous Austro-Hungarian Winter Carpathian Offensives in early 1915, Brusilov again defeated the Austrians and took nearly 50,000 prisoners. His troops also repulsed the Austrian relief effort at the fortress of Przemysl. Despite being raised by Russian Germans and having a mother of Polish descent, Brusilov advocated the forced deportation of Germans and Poles from Russia, saying, without a doubt, they sabotage telephone and telegraph wires. In October 1915, over three days, 20,000 civilians of German descent were deported. On March 17, 1916, Alexei Brusilov became commander of the Southwestern Front and began to plan what would be the Brusilov Offensive. The Russian high command did not think that an offensive on that front would succeed, but Brusilov figured that with the continuing fighting on the Italian front and knowing that Austria did not have a lot of reserves on the Russian front, he could knock them out of the war. His plan was carefully planned and rehearsed at all levels of command. In his own words, 
Positioning of artillery of different calibers, whereby each artillery group has its own special task, and each type of artillery has its own special use. Creating telephone lines and forward posts. Preparing the concentration points to within 200 to 300 paces of the enemy trenches. All of it requires no less than six to eight weeks of time. He realized that all of these preparations would be visible to the enemy. So he ordered all armies along the whole front to do these preparations so the enemy would not know where the main attack was to be. The attack was to begin June 1st, 1916, but weather delayed it till the 4th. And it blew the Austrians away. Seriously, while some of his armies were tying down much of the front, Alexei Kaledin's troops broke through the Austro-Hungarian lines on a 16-kilometer front. They captured the strategic town of Lutsk on the 7th and demolished the Austrian 4th Army, advancing dozens of kilometers. Now this caused the rest of the Austrian forces to retreat as well to avoid encirclement. Over that summer, the Russians advanced 120 kilometers, swarming over Bukovina and parts of Galicia, and Austria-Hungary took about a million casualties. Some estimates are higher. When added to a few hundred thousand German casualties and hundreds of thousands more Russian ones, you're getting close to two million total. German reinforcements and eventual supply and logistical problems did manage to stem the tide, but the might of the Austro-Hungarian army was pretty much broken by the offensive, and in future, it would always play a subordinate role to its German superiors. Although Brusilov's dream of knocking Austria out of the war was not realized. At the time, it was called the Lutsk Breakthrough, since Russian army operations were named after their geographical objectives. But after the petitioning of many of his junior officers, it was changed to the Brusilov Breakthrough, or Brusilov Offensive, as it was known in the West. Brusilov himself did not want the name change. It's worth noting that the Vimy Ridge Offensive, later planned and executed by Arthur Curry, paralleled Brusilov's attack. Short but massive artillery bombardment, extensive training and rehearsing, simultaneous attacks along the whole front, large reserves to continue the offensive after a breakthrough, and extensive aerial photography. Despite huge success and recognition, Brusilov had this to say. The operation did not produce any strategic results, and it could not produce any because the decision of the military council was not carried out. Western Front did not deliver the main blow, and the Northern Front had as its motto, patience, patience, patience. The high command, in my opinion, completely failed in its mission to command, and not only did not control the events, but instead, the events controlled the high command like a wind controlling the shaking reeds. In late 1916, food and uniform supply problems plagued the Russian army, and there were rumors of disarray in Petrograd. Brusilov believed that without strong measures, revolution was likely, but he still began planning a 1917 spring offensive. This was interrupted by the February Revolution. Brusilov was part of the faction that supported the Tsar's abdication, and in May 1917, he was promoted to commander of the entire Russian army by the provisional government that replaced the Tsar. He tried to restore order in the army, but there were widespread desertions, and whole divisions laid down their weapons and went home. There were also Bolshevik cells in the army that often successfully convinced soldiers to shoot their officers. The front was crumbling, and in July, Brusilov was dismissed and replaced by Lav Kornilov, who ironically plotted against the provisional government that gave him the post. Kornilov's coup failed, and I'll note here that Brusilov absolutely refused to support it. Brusilov was wounded in the October Revolution, though he took no part in the fighting, and after recovering, was persuaded to join the Red Army. He retired in 1924 and died of heart failure following a lung infection in 1926. His funeral was a huge public event, and he was buried with full military honors in Moscow. He was a figure of contrasts, an officer in both the Tsarist and Bolshevik armies a man of Polish heritage and Russo-German upbringing, and yet a fierce Russian nationalist, a friend of the Russian royal family, and yet deeply critical of the Tsar. He was, in short, larger than life, and his name will go down in history as the architect of Russia's finest moment of the war and the Tsarist army's 
final great triumph. We'd like to thank Arsini Krichever for doing the bulk of the research for this episode. If you'd like to see one of our episodes about the Winter Carpathian Offensives that Bruce Lee Love took part in, you can click right here for that. You should uh, follow us on Facebook and like us on Instagram, or like us on Facebook and follow us on Instagram and Twitter. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.